The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. Tyke, I don't know if that reminds you of anyone in particular, maybe someone you might know. Um, he might be uh, an exceptional athlete. He might be very close to you. He also might be from Castle Gar. Welcome to Enter the Arena, episode four. So um, I don't know if you want to say anything else, Tyke, about this particular guest. Maybe give us some inside information. I don't know, maybe your mom and dad might know a little bit about him. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, sounds back in episode four. Thankfully, the first three went down extremely well, which I thought they would, given the, the who the lads are and you know getting, getting a shot off the NFL. But yeah, today's guest is the last of the, the, the four Irish guys who've been signed up for the NFL international program. Um, he is... My younger brother, by only a year and a bit, uh, we grew up together just like pucking each other. And to be honest, we still are. So that's a challenge we have at the minute, <laughs> getting ready to go to camp in Florida for a month living together. I've requested that we live, we're in different, uh, we're in villas out there for training camp. So I've requested that Darren and I be in different houses because, um, <laughs> like, all joking aside, <laughs> we have the ability to get under each other's nerves. But at the end of the day, for this process, um, the good thing about what we do here, it's all metric driven and the lad exceeded all the metrics we set and uh, as a result he's got the opportunity so it's that that's kind of how that all came about yeah and I'm sure it is um you know talking to uh, Rory and Mark and Charlie um it was quite uh, an intense workout they were brought to and not a whole lot of prep time so everyone who got there they did they did earn it and um I can't wait to get into him I know he's got a very interesting story you both have deep backgrounds in Connacht um so is there anything else you want to add before we get into it about your brother or about the program so far? Uh, now about him, he can do his own talk and I'm not going to send more about him. Um, he can do his own chatting. But in terms of the program, yeah, we're just, we did it since, you know, we're just back from the training camp in Boston, got the trade at the New England Patriots facility for um, four or five days there, getting on American turf so that I could actually be kicking on the proper, you know, hashes, distances, yellow posts. Uh, that was class boys hit the again metrics boys hit the metrics and exceeded them so it was, yeah it was I think boys, I saw Mark Jackson hit, hit hit one with his right and then one with his left <laughs> yeah that was, I didn't know he could do that I genuinely didn't he just <laughs> he just banged he just put one down and I was like you're teeing up on your left there he goes 45 yards right hash and just just banged it but, like, he, he, but that goes to show how really talented these lads are especially growing up you know playing Gaelic football they're using both feet all the time so um now that was cool for the lads to show off, and Charlie, in fairness, did did one just after that as well. It wasn't as mechanically uh, or visually pleasing, but he got the ball over, so that's all that's important, really. Um, but yeah, no, for the boys to go to an NFL facility, feel that for the first time in America, uh, ahead of going back next month or a couple of weeks, was um, just a really, really good opportunity for everyone. For me to you know just confirm they're at the level I thought they were at, because it's one thing banging a touchback or I'd say a seventy five yard kickoff on a Gaelic pitch versus doing it on, you know, an American football page. It's just, it just gives a lot more confidence to the group. So, uh, yeah, class trip. And um, next time we're back on American soil, man, it's visibly Florida, three weeks out from the week, from the combine. So that's pretty gas to be saying. Well, without, without further ado, I'll leave it at that, at that little cliffhanger kind of going in. This is Entry Arena, episode four, Dara Leader. He is the first Irish-born rugby player um, to make it through to the NFL IPP program. He's going to be competing in the NFL Combine in March in Indianapolis. He also holds a record for one of the longest kicks in rugby union. And he's a born and bred proud Galway man playing for Connacht, played for Connacht. Dara Leader, welcome to Enter the Arena. Cheers, Cara. Thanks for having me. That's a good, good for the confidence hearing all that. How is the confidence? Is the confidence kind of low right now? I know you just got back from no. a kicking session with Rory and Mark and Charlie and the lads. How did it go? No, it actually went quite well today. I hadn't been practicing too much kickoffs, but today was kind of my first day giving it full welly and it actually went really well. So I'm happy, happy after that. We couldn't punt too much inside because the roof's quite low in there. But uh, yeah, because you're up in the uh, the sports arena right in Dublin. Yeah, Sports Ireland and. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the roof isn't quite high enough. So hopefully, Tykes should be right now sorting out us to go to the Mayo Galway Dome they have here. The roof's going to be nice and high there. So hope they can, we can go there and smack a few points. I hope so. I hope so. I mean, uh, he didn't have the nicest things to say about you in our intro, you know, um, but maybe that was just a bit he of brotherly love. No, he never really does. I think he's first come in every 
group we ever join together with other people are in is always extremely negative usually calling himself good looking and me not good looking and him being the better brother and all sorts of crap but in reality it's usually the opposite way around <laughs> well just to get into that i mean how much does he weigh because i think you're the bigger brother right now right i am definitely the bigger brother uh i'd say he's a skinny measly maybe maybe he'd be lucky if he's if he's even in the 90s where i'm probably teetering on the edge of 100 kg that is and that's right. That's right. So you're six foot three, you're a hundred kg. You played a lot of rugby in your life. Um, so I think, I guess kind of getting into this NFL IPP stuff, are you going primarily as a kicker? Are you going primarily as a punter? Or are you going as both? I will primarily be doing punting and then kickoffs. So probably not field goal. I may, I may dabble in it, but my best attribute in rugby has always been just kicking the ball a long way off punts. So most likely or just that and then kickoffs, maybe field goals, but not uh, right now we're not sure which I'm, if I'm doing that as well. Okay, gotcha. And how has the kind of transition it and guess been about um, punting kind of with an American football and a rugby ball? Do you find it kind of hard to transition? Because, um, you know, like especially you're a fullback. So just to get into it, you were primarily a fullback. You've also played in the wing yeah. a few other positions, but you were primarily a fullback and you used to boot in the ball big and long from very, very far. So what was the transition like moving from a rugby ball to a uh, leather American football? Yeah, it's, I think it's like the, it's at the start, you're kind of like, oh, this isn't too bad. It's basically a rugby ball, just boot it and it'd be all right. But then the more you do it and you're like, so when I first sent out like, a few videos, me kicking like two months back, whatever, I was Joe. I was kicking the ball and I was I was banging it a long way in a good spiral. But then, like, you send the video and he's like, "Wait a minute, your hands are too slow. What are you doing with your feet? The ball's dropping off the table." Like, I thought I was doing a pretty decent job for my first few sessions, and he's just like, "Yeah, the kick's good, but all the other parts aren't up to standard." And like, he didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know, basically. Um, but now, thankfully, I do. So, in terms of the actual strike of the kick. Um, in rugby, I I would have end over ended everything like Aussie style punt. I never would have spiraled. I think I've done more banana kicks in a rugby game than I have spirals, and I haven't done that many banana kicks. Right so, now, now, now on that, do they kind of do they kind of vary away from uh, kicking spirals in rugby in the modern game? Because I grew up watching um, like mainly like guys like Ron, Ron Regara. To be honest, I'm a Munster fan. I'm a Cork man. Look, I played <laughs> played in Cork Con when I was nine years old. I was oh, one man. season, one and done. But I remember he used to spiral all the time and people were always kind of talking about how pure of a kicker he is. But then as I think the game progressed, maybe legs got a bit stronger. It seemed like that kind of got out of the game a little bit. Yeah, definitely. It. Uh, yeah, when I first started watching rugby, just before I got into the professional scene, yeah, like when Rod was playing, spirals were all the, were all the craze. And even Sexton spiraled for a while more recently, but like it's, it's completely gone out of the game. And I kind of wish I was trained in American football or watched more videos like this or like kicking videos when I was playing rugby because we, we even though we had kicking coaches, they never went into the detail that you go into in American football. Joe, every little thing is analyzed. Where in rugby, it's kind of like, I ah, go out there and try a few spirals and if it comes off, it comes off. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And they don't really tell you, oh, it's because your foot position was too left or too right. You dropped it or whatever, or your angle of the ball. They never went into that detail. So I was kind of like, go out and try it. If you got it, you got it. If you didn't, you didn't. And you never really like, looked into and analysed why you didn't get it. Um, yeah, so and I do, and I, I did a lot of punting as well in American football, and I always remembered, you know, the little things like, you know, the ball is going to be a certain tilt, which is very similar yeah. to rugby, but then it depends whether your nose is down, whether your nose is up, because obviously it's a leather ball, it's not a composite like a rugby ball, mm. and it depends how much it's leaned out. Your steps have got to be very straight, can't really bit an angle yeah. a whole lot, um, and then obviously flexibility and extension of the leg. Um, yeah. And then all this has to be done in a very short amount of time. So how was it kind of adjusting to like the timing of it all? Yeah, definitely that was hard. I actually saw a video of you doing the one, I mean, two, three days ago, you posting a story. And I was like, I said to Tiger France, it looked very good. It's the one you posted up. <laughs> oh, and well, nice I, try nice not, I try not to post the bad ones, Darry. I might still get a, good, a shot one day, you know? Yeah. The, uh, yeah, no, it is, it is obviously hard because... Yeah, at the start, as I said, I was chopping my feet sometimes. I was doing things I don't even notice and I was doing it. Like, a big thing was when I put the ball on the table, when I'd just go into my drive step, I'd drop the ball and then bring it back there, kind of like get momentum. That's just like a habit from rugby, maybe. And I just, mm. enjoy, I didn't realize I was doing it. And Ty was like, look at this. I was like, why are you doing this? And I'm kind of like, oh, it feels a bit awkward 
just like holding it there and leaving it there. But like, as you said, if you're dropping and going back to that spot, it's like you're adding in extra movements that you don't need. And it's obviously NFL coaches, fine margins matter. So you have to take those things out of it. And yeah, yeah I did yes, find I that do. type of thing. Yeah, I did I did find that those type of things a little bit awkward to start. But obviously the more you do it, the better you get at us. Like in every gym session I do now, instead of before I might go on my phone in between sets, now I do at least 10 bad ball drops or catching moles and things like that. So I'm slowly but surely getting, you know, a few hundred to a few thousand reps in every week. And that's getting a lot, lot better all the time. Even today, just getting live snaps from Barry was really good. Just catch him all was much better than it was maybe a week ago. So it's constantly improving. And yeah, I feel like I'm definitely going the right direction and doing quite good. So hopefully I keep that trajectory up all the way until the combine and beyond. Yeah, um, I, and just to, I want to give people an idea of, of how different it is because I think they look at it and they're like, well, you know, and even talk about it, talk, talk about roaring the lads, which are mainly doing kicking from the ground, but the the steps and the timing involved. So usually as a fullback, I played a bit of fullback as well. The ball would come mm. back. You have you have quite a bit of time, unless you're under an immense amount of pressure, but you usually don't even think about stepping. You just take a couple of, mm. couple of stutter steps, you, you put the ball out, you drop a little bit, and you just put your boot behind it. And, you know, it goes in the direction you want it to go. But with American football, especially with punting, they talk a lot about, are you a two-step punter? Are you a three-step yeah. punter? Or are you like a two and a half? Do you jab and go? Um, so I think what you were talking about there is, you know, when you catch it, you already have to go. It's one jab, okay? And then it's a step and then you boot. Is that what you're doing? You're doing like a jab, one step, yeah. and then go? I was doing one and a half literally up until yesterday, but because I know we're, we're messing with seeing if I do, it was one and a half what I was doing for the past few months, but I'm trying just to see if doing the two and a half gets me a little bit more distance, but just because the weather's been basically a hurricane, it's kind of hard to tell if you're getting more distance. Or it's just Lovely Galway weather. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was a, I was doing a one and a half and I'm messing around with trying out a two step or two and a half at the moment. So left foot forward versus, I was just doing right foot forward and then small jab and then left and then kick. But gotcha. now I'm trying left foot forward, right, left kick. Well, if it helps at all, um, and they don't want to listen to your older brother, and you can listen to me, I would I would add in the extra step. A lot of punters in the NFL at the moment are moving towards three steps because they basically just want distance, they want yeah. massive distance. And if you're in a combine scenario, you basically want to show off how big the leg is and how powerful it is, yeah. not necessarily how fast it is. Now, to give, uh, I guess, more listeners as well, the amount of time you actually have. So the whole process, so you said you're working with a snapper today. So snapper will snap the ball back to the punter. Okay, and then punter catches it, puts the ball out in front, and then crushes it. Ideally, before any of the linemen or anybody gets next to you. So, you know, there's another 11 players running at you, trying mm-hmm. to trying to eat you live. You have approximately 1.3 seconds from when the ball touches your hand to when it needs to leave your foot. The whole operation usually needs to be about 2 seconds, 2.1 maybe. So, was that kind of very difficult to get used to? Have you been practicing that a whole lot? And I guess, are you feeling confident about that in March? Sticking yeah, to those metrics? Yeah. Um, yeah, obviously it's been quite hard. Like I I was training by myself in America for the past few weeks. So I've only actually been coached maybe for like, or I've been getting coached by Tyg here in person for like only like maybe two weeks. So I didn't really have a snapper around them. But oh, oh, when we, we trained up the, in New England there two weekends ago, I think it was now. And we had, a, we had a really good snapper there with us. And then we have a snapper here in, the, in our arm that comes to our session. So our timings are very, we're on it sometimes and then sometimes not on it. But compared to where I was, again, like two weeks before I started, I've gotten, maybe I was at like 1.5 to 1.6 mm-hmm. two weeks ago. I'm kind of like very on that 1.3 now at the moment. So it was hard to start. And as, as I said, I'm still kind of new to it in a way, but I feel like between that and like holding or two things that are quite technical, I've improved a lot very quickly at it. And I'm hoping that, uh, I said, that tra- trajectory keeps going. So I'm confident I'll have it down like every time by the combine at that yeah. point three mark. And to get it to holding real quick, how have you been getting used to that? So for anyone who, does, who doesn't know exactly what a punter does, just very, very briefly, punter is different than the kicker. They're two different positions in American football. Um, but a punter is nearly always the holder for an NFL team. If it's a college football team, they usually put a backup quarterback in there, a starting quarterback because they've got good hands. For an NFL team, 
in a CFL team, it's always the punter. So the holder is the person who makes the whole thing work. He's the fulcrum of the whole situation. He's the sword and the stone. He's everything. So what was it like kind of getting used to that and kind of the pressure of it? Because you have like, it's, it's less than probably like ha- half a second to grab the ball with your right hands. You're eight yards away from the snapper. Put your hands out, got to grab the ball, put it on the ground. Good angle, good tilt, laces away for the mm-hmm. kicker to get that away. So how has that been? And were you absolutely bricking it the first time you tried it? Um, randomly enough, Tide was, it was at Patriots where we first tried it, their, their facility there two weeks ago. And Tide was telling me how hard it was going to be and how it took him a long time to get it. But to be honest, I kind of got it basically in like the first session. It's not, I think maybe just coming to the rugby and be good with your hands. Um, that just stood to me. So the hardest part for me was basically sitting down for 10 reps on your back ankle being bent as the way you have to sit in it. That kind of hurts just sitting on for so long. But in terms of the actual hold, like I, I feel like I'm like I'm where I need to be with that already, um, even though I'm only like two weeks into it. But And especially even the last two days practicing in Ireland with the hurricane winds and freezing cold, like... I think that'll get you good at holding that'll get you good at holding real yeah. quick holding those oh, conditions yeah so um, yeah I got a few good tips like maybe my, my first session is other kicking coach came and helped us out and I did I, again I didn't know my first session doing so I didn't know a lot of things but he gave me a lot of good tips and along with Tyg and I feel like between having my elbow like against my left knee and just letting the ball come to me and not having my right hand close so I'm just catching and extending my elbows and then, like, spreading your hands and the ball so you can kind of feel where the laces are. And obviously, if you get a good snap from the snapper, it's really easy. They just catch and put it down. But Nine even days. if I do have to spin, um, I kind yeah, I feel like I have it, like, I'm pretty good at getting this pretty much, like, perfect every time already. Amazing. Um, well, honestly, honestly, yeah. that's that's a big that's a big step of it because what they'll do is they'll look at how good you are as a punter, to look how strong your leg is, to look how accurate you are, to look how well you're spiraling the ball instead of hitting it end over end because anyone could hit it end over end. But they want the spiral, they want the high hang time, and then they'll look at you as a holder. And if you can punt great but you can't hold at all, I mean, you're done. yeah. So oh, clearly, that's, that's that's what Tyke tells us all the time is like non-negotiables is that if you're if you're not doing field goals you have to hold and if you can't hold it, it's over before it starts so that's why I was good I was kind of happy but maybe he, he's not as athletic and as learned as I am that took him a long time to get it but I got it yeah I feel like I've gotten it already and it only took me one or two sessions to have it pretty much down like today I probably would have held 30 balls and I think basically 29 of them were perfect and one of them was a little bit off but it's because the snap was up above my head and I still got down in time um but my hand was holding like this as opposed to like that on top. That was basically the the worst not, of today. So not a bad if ratio, Dara. That's pretty yeah. good. And so let's talk a little bit about uh you mentioned um the lack of athleticism in your brother. But no, let's let's talk about how athletic how athletic you were um as an athlete growing up and how you are. So when did when did things really kick off for you um for rugby and in terms of conduct? Um, I know you got a strong background in there. You obviously come from a sporting family, but do you want to kind of give me a little bit of information about how you started there? Yeah, um, where Connacht was basically, yeah, I started playing rugby, kind, well, probably around in the 13s, 14s with Galwegians. Then I was in the Bish St. Joseph College in Galway for playing rugby there. And then I was kind of in and around the Connacht squads, under 7, under 16, 17, 18, then 19 growing up. And did you get did you get did you get brought in from schools there or how did they yeah, how did they find yeah. their players? So it's kind of yeah you, they do like these training camps or open sessions and you all go to them and play like I don't know two or three games a day it could be like fifty or hundred kids there and so they just pick you from whoever plays well in those games and random teams. Um, and then they obviously have guys that go out to schools and watch you as well, kind of like scouts in the NFL in a way, but not as I wouldn't say as. Uh, as uh, like broad amount like that many scouts fans like one guy that might go to a couple of games around the around this college or their football scene here or rugby scene sorry um, so yeah I played under age 17s 18s 19s and then I was playing for the Connacht second team when I was under 20 so 19 and then I had a few good games there in a row I, I was playing pretty well for the Connacht 20s and a few good games for the Connacht A team and then I'd had my first cap against Ospreys, I think it was October 2013 or 2012. Um, 
under Eric Elwood. So yeah, I had my first cap there against the Ospreys. I think yeah, I had a few good games to the A, a side, and a few good kicks. Out of hand, it would have been. Um, and then I broke into the Connor senior side and Ospreys, yeah. Um, and so were you, so you say you out of hand, were you were kicking off a tee at this point or were you just This was all back? out of hand stuff. Gotcha. I, I was I was doing place kicks for the, my like under twenties team, but for the A team, I think Jack Carthy might have been doing it at the time. But I was doing kicks to touch and stuff. And I, I Jack's pretty great. good at the old kicks as well. So yeah, it's not too bad in fairness to him. So uh, yeah, I was just doing I, I, yeah basically a good kick from fullback. Obviously, you said that you've of time, and I was good at just smashing down the field and doing exits and stuff. So that kind of stood to me. And then I played. Uh, Eric brought me in then for the Ospreys game and. I had a pretty cool experience in my first game just playing over in Ospreys and Dan Parks was playing with, with Connor to the time who's the Scotland 10 and Aussie guy and yeah I got a room with him for that game so it was pretty cool getting to learn from one of the most most capped kind of internationals at the time one of the best 10s in the world at the time so that was a pretty cool experience um, So were you able to just like pick his brain a little bit or was it all business? Uh, it was a bit of both the rest, I had a bit of a, a bit of a a great first cap story, but I can't really talk about it on here, but Dan Parks showed me a good time uh, way back then. So, uh, that, yeah, those upsides to room with them before and after the game. <laughs> okay, okay. We can we can leave it at that. And so you also got selected to the Ireland under 20 squad. Um, so what was that like kind of, you know, you're from Castle Gar, not exactly a big place. Um, mm-hmm. You managed to play uh, under age or Connacht. You go through all these things. Um, you know, you're in and out, you're not quite in the first team, then you're in the first team, but then you get on the Ireland under 20 team. So what was that like? Just, yeah, I don't know, just intrinsically, I, that for me would have just been, you know, I actually couldn't even process that. Yeah, no, it was very cool. Um, so I said, like growing up, Tyke was always the better rugby brother and he was the one playing for like Ross Gray and like he, made, he was in the academy before I was and getting paid meagle money or measly money, but... He was still getting paid and I wasn't. Um, <laughs> so it was good to, when I finally got started getting selected for these teams and showing that I that there wasn't just Greg and my other brother and Ty, they were good. I was also the good brother coming up behind. So yeah, no, the, all that stuff is very cool. And Joe playing our in the 20s, um, we got to go over to France, playing over in La Rochelle and play against New Zealand, uh, Australia. They were all like really cool games. And to, to experience like the Hakka and stuff, that was crazy. We didn't have the best. I actually got a really bad infection after we played New Zealand. I had to come home because of like a mosquito bite uh, early from that. Wow. But yeah, I had a big, had a big hole in my leg, like a fit, like this finger into like an inch or two. So uh, it wasn't the best ending, but it was a really cool to experience all that and being a part of like that atmosphere. And to a lot of guys in that team eventually went on to like play professional rugby, like Tom Daly's in Connacht now, Stuart Oling was there. Uh, Adam Byrne was there and there was loads of like really high quality players Josh van der Flyer was there World Fair of the Year so there's a lot of great players on that team and it was really cool to be around those those type of guys that early in my rugby career Right and um, and I guess now at, at that point you kind of maybe hit I guess a, maybe a peak you might call it but you got a phone call uh, from someone saying you've been selected for another team the big yeah. one, the Joe Schmidt team. Do you want to tell yeah. me what happened with that phone call? Yeah, that was cool as well. Um, so the, and it was twenty fourteen, right? Was it twenty fourteen? Yeah. So we're kind of getting that, that the following season. Pat Lamb came in, and I started off the season really well. I was starting fullback or wing most games. I was having just a good run of form, good kicks. I was actually after I scored the the, the big kick from the sixty two meters to beast. Um, What's that called? Rother, Rother, Rotherham, um, and then I played for the senior team the next few weeks in a row, and I was on I was on a very good streak of form there. And then I was, I was just I was driving home one night. I think Caelan Blade was in my car. And I got the traffic lights, and I got this random phone call. This number pop up, so I just answer at the traffic lights, and I was turned right, so I was kind of waiting for the, the right signal to come on, and I answer it, and it's like, oh, hey, this is like Joe Schmidt, and I was kind of like. This doesn't seem like it's Joe Schmidt. I it like, seemed like a weird accent on the phone. So I actually thought it might have been Jack Carthy prank phone calling me at the time. So I was kind of sitting at the lights. The lights went green, but I didn't know what to do. And there's no one behind me. So I was like, oh, I just didn't bother moving. I just sat there. And he's kind of like saying like, oh, like we're, you know, you're playing really well recently. And welcome, like you're, we want to call you into camp for a little bit. 
Uh, at the time, I didn't want to act too excited because I was kind of like, if this is Jack, this would be really embarrassing if I'm just all of a sudden so being like all excited about it. So I, I, I didn't really believe it while I was on the phone to him. I was kind of like, oh, yeah, 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 that's, that's cool, really cool. Thanks for having me. I didn't really give him too much emotion about it for it so uh he must have thought then you were like you know god this guy's such a strong character he wasn't he wasn't even faced <laughs> yeah no i literally yeah, i wasn't um so i eventually yeah I drove off but luckily then pat lamb called me like a minute after he hung up pat lamb called me and i was like hey that actually was joe schmidt and i was like oh crap <laughs> I, so i told pat what happened but no it was unreal to get that phone call and it was unreal to be a part of that environment and just to see how see how, how he operated. Joe, I, I sometimes tell people in America, Joe Schmidt is kind of like the Bill Belichick of rugby in terms of like he mm -hmm. creates new ideas and he's on the cutting edge of things and he's just like an unbelievable coach. So it was pretty insane to get that phone call and to, to drive from my government. got home to my family and told my parents they were just like, what the hell? You're in the Ireland squad. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm as shocked as you. I, at the time, I didn't even think about it. It wasn't even in my, on my radar. And then all of a sudden I was in there and training with them and stuff like that. So it was a pretty crazy time. Oh, it must have been nice to ride, the, especially the family. And you obviously got two jealous brothers there, probably. Yeah, no, Looking, looking was, for that uh, shot, too. Yeah. no, Because your dad your, your, your dad was heavily involved as well with, um, was it Galwegians and, and rugby in general? And then your mom's always obviously heavily involved in sport as well. Yeah, yeah. So Noel was... I think at the time he might have been just finished finished his season as the president of Galwegian. So <coughs> obviously, and he played a lot of rugby growing up. Plays a, a very small prop, but he was a prop. And then, uh, yeah, my mother's involved in rowing Ireland and stuff there. She's the club secretary and involved in all that. So we're a big sporting family. And it was, uh, as I said, it was unreal to be able to come home and tell them, Joe, you know, I'm in the Ireland squad. And they're just like, this is crazy. My dad finally said, I was like, that's when it kind of changed for me from being the lowest or the least recognized brother to where everyone now been, like my dad, would always, when I'm in the street, people always be like, oh, you're no leader's son. When Noel's like, now it's changed. Oh, you're, you're dire leader's father. So <laughs> that's kind of what he used to get after that. I think that's when he knows he's made it in Galway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> um, okay, so... Um, that, that, I mean, that's amazing. So you've gone through kind of rugby, you've gone through all the ages. You went play Ireland in the 20. You've got a call up to the Ireland squad. Um, how was your time in general then, like kind of looking back at your rugby career? Because um, you've you've more or less retired from the rugby career now. You're entering mm -hmm. a new career. But looking back, like how how was it for you? Was there any like why like why why don't why don't I know Darley? Why isn't Darley leader Hugo Keenan at the moment? Is it like the bad injuries happened? Did it just kind of not work out? Yeah. Just from your perspective, or um, yeah, I kind of got very unlucky then after. So basically, that that was November internationals, and then when it came to Six Nations, I was playing quite well again. But I think it was Rob Carney or Hugo or Felix Jones was injured at the time, so that kind of helped me to get into the squad at the time. So I, he called me to let me know I wasn't in the Six Nations, but he's like, "Oh, the Emerging Ireland team are having a tour that next summer, so you can go on that." But then. Before that, I had like a small hamstring injury and they wanted me to bulk up in weights. So like, oh, you just focus on the offseason, just getting bigger and heavier and not worry about the Ireland tour because you're injury and stuff. But then that preseason, we we're playing a game against um, Castra in France, a preseason game. In fact, we had one game before that and I played really well and I was starting ahead of, or like Tierney Holland, but obviously my main competition in Connacht and I was starting ahead of him that game. He was in the wing or at fullback and... I went, basically, ball was kicked in behind. I ran back to pick it up, kind of slid in the ground to get it. Joe stood up. I was in, like, a push-up position. Someone tackled me while I was getting in, like, a push-up position, getting off the ground. And at the time, I just thought, whatever, sprained my wrist or, or something like that. Played the rest of the game. The next day, I was, like, trying to get out of a pool, and I put my hands on the edge of the pool to um, push up to get out. And I was like, what the hell? I can't play any, like, pressure through my wrist. So then I saw the physio. He was like, oh, I think you just sprained it, whatever. Then I took like a week or two off. And this was the physio, was it a physio conic, sorry? Or? Yeah, conic physio, yeah. Gotcha. And then he was kind of like, oh, it's just, you might have just sprained it. So I took a two or three, two or three weeks off. And then, then I, I was training, but when I after my catch a ball, my wrist was like dislocating. Like I get like this shooting electrocution pain up to my arm. My arm would lose all its power. And I go into the physio, like, hey, like this is happening. I can't really catch a rugby ball getting passed from the right, from the right to left. And he's like, whatever had a look at it. eventually went got an MRI they were like oh we can't see too much wrong with it and I was like it literally my wrist feels like it's I can't even use it 
So then we had a few important games that season. Um, so their part was like, I want you to keep trying to keep playing. It doesn't seem like the physio is saying you're okay. Remember, the MRI doesn't really show on. So they're like, come on, they keep playing. So eventually, but I, I couldn't literally catch a rugby ball. Like right to left, it hit my hand and my whole wrist were like dislocating. I feel bones moving. So then I literally went into my dad's garage and I found a metal bar. So I went to play games. I strapped a metal bar to the back of my wrist so it couldn't bend backwards because that was for hurt. It was like a pass. It would like pop back. Um, so then I played eight games of this injury. We didn't know what, what it was, but with this metal bar strapped to my hand. But then eventually we were playing against Cardiff um, over in Wales and I'd carried the ball into contact and I fell to the ground because of the metal bar there. My hand couldn't go like that to bend back. So then my finger like snapped back over the metal bar basically. So then eventually they were like, all right, if you have this injury, you can get another MRI in your wrist and while you're out with that, get both and fix at the same time. So then we figured out I had a torn scaphoid lunate ligament and the hand, I went and got a surgery on it, but it turns out because we didn't get it done right away, the surgeon did the wrong surgery. So I went through like six months of rehab with that, only to let at the end of it be told, well, the, the surgeon said my, my wrist was fixed, but I was like doing the test and I was like, this is not feel fixed. So then I had to go see another surgeon. He did a surgery. He was like, yeah, your, your ligament's still torn, not fixed. And then I had to do another six to no, or another nine months with him. So then a long, long story short, I was out. Well, well, were, you, were, you, were you training during this? So in between the surgeries or whatever, were you still trying to train? Yeah, was like, like, all what, the time. What was Connacht yeah. actually saying to you? Were they saying like, oh, keep playing. Just don't, don't go through catching drills. Probably don't yeah. do bench press. No, so basically at the at the time, yeah, I was in, I was wearing a cast the whole time. It was like while when I was going through the first start of it before I realised what was wrong, they were trying to get him to come back and play. And as I said, I was strapping a metal bar to the back of my wrist to try and so I could literally I couldn't hold a rugby ball. I was so when you put the rugby ball here, I was holding it with the pressure against my body. I wasn't going to put my hand over the top of it. So like I was playing games with basically one and a half hands. So for anyone was, listening to this on audio, what he's describing is he's holding his arm and wrist out straight and just kind of holding, holding his the wrist pressure. to his chest just using the pressure yeah. and not actually using his wrist or his fingers or anything else yeah Can't no continue. I was just playing yeah one and a half arm so but yeah throughout the process you're obviously training all the time you're just doing leg stuff fitness you're doing I became the world's best improviser in the gym because I couldn't do chess I was like strapping bands to my elbow I was like strapping bands over calves so I was like doing every most random exercise you can think of to try and get some sort of some sort of exercise through my upper body because, uh, yeah, I was very limited. After the whole process, I think I was in a cast for like 30-something, 30 39-odd weeks just in a cast alone. So my left arm took a bit of a hit in terms of its size uh, through it all. But, yeah, it was a crazy process and, like, that basically kept me out of the game for two whole years. Like, even when we went on to win the Pro 14, that, like, summer, my worst day was basically when I found out was after a week after we won the Pro 14, I had to go. With, I went to that second surgeon, and he, I wake up from the surgery. He's like, "Here, you're actually your wrist isn't fixed at all, and you're going to be out for basically another year." And I was just like, "This should be the best time of my career, and it's basically the worst." Oh, and um, what age were you? What age were you at this stage, there? Twenty-two or three. Oh. yeah. So it was pretty. It wasn't great. Um, so, 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 how did you? I mean, how did you deal with that? I mean, did. Did you just go home and kind of sulk about it? Did you try and kind of... Not Did you have really. any strategies or any kind of anything to kind of help you kind of manage that? Because obviously we talk mm. a lot about professional players and how injuries can be like the hardest part of the game, you know? Yeah. No, I was crazy. Like, Joe, people think ACL is the worst injury and the amount of guys that came in... Joe, I, when you're injured, you're in anything called injury club. So you go in before the lads train you, and you train after they finish the day. So you go to the meetings and stuff and... Like guys would tear the ACL and be come and gone, like tear it after me and be come and gone back playing while I'm still out injured. And like that happened multiple times. Like, so different guys had, had like ACLs torn. They're in injury club way less time than I was with my injuries. So, yeah, it was slightly tough, but I'm generally a very kind of happy person and stuff. So it didn't really, and guys just naive to like the seriousness of my situation. I had a nice dog, so I was always on dog walk. And then, like, I remember one time Jack Hart, did say to me, though, he's like, geez, there, how are you so happy? You're literally, like, just injured this whole, for like a year and a half, and, like, you can't do your job for like a year and a half. But I don't know, at the time, I was kind of naive to it. And I was just, uh, you know, obviously, being part of a rugby squad, cool looks. You were hanging out with your friends every day, you know, going for coffees, working out in the gym, you know, doing things you enjoy doing. So I never really saw rugby as work. So, so did they, so you, did they kind of support you in that or were they just constantly like, like, how are you so happy or? 
Uh, no, the fans are rugby lads, are, but I kind of like this. I'd like to kind of be slagging you, but Jesus Christ, they're always injured. Like, do you ever just stop being like, stop being a coward or whatever and just get out and play? Like, but so I don't mind that kind of banter. Uh, but yeah, they do sports, and obviously, we got in a few new physios and stuff at that time as well. So the old physio that probably wasn't the best in the world. Uh, they got rid of him thankfully and then the other guys came in they were much better and much more supportive so a lot of stuff changed in and around that time as well so it was suited me and made things easier for me being injured and when you finally bounced back then you know after putting on probably 10 kg after all your new exercises yeah. um, copyright Daryl leader exercises yeah um, how did it feel kind of getting back playing and then were, did you feel like you were the same player were you nervous you know um, well, I'm Charles. One like I remember you used to text me before about like big moments in my career. I remember because like I said, my wrist I was like like this the whole time. Um, just been able to like I used to like hand it off with my left hand. That's what I love doing in rugby. I was good at this. Um, and then I remember being in the pool one day, being like, Jesus Christ, am I ever gonna be able to do a push up again or have my hand in that position? And I remember being in the pool and I was kind of like floating down to the bottom of the water in the pool and like put the tiniest bit of pressure through my hand and I was like oh, okay, I can, like, kind of do this. And then I, like, sort of took my right hand off and was doing just my left and I was doing a push-up. And I was like, all right, maybe there is light at the end of the tunnel with this injury. Um, but, yeah, when I came back, it was, like, it was... it was Obviously, at first, Joe, for being injured for so long and the contracts being up and stuff, you're like, Jesus Christ, I need to come back here and play well right away. And But then you're kind of like, oh, my God, I can't afford to get injured again because, like, I've just <clears> been out for so long. So it's kind of a bit of both where you're kind of minding yourself on the field but also being like crap I need to play real well here to get under the contract so it was tough at the time but luckily I managed to play pretty well my first few games back so they kept me on again for the following season so that was good but yeah it was kind of nerve-wracking and stuff you're being out for so long you're always kind of a bit wary and you know, you're a bit worried it might happen again so you do kind of mind yourself and I was basically I actually found this really cool contraption gymnasts use to protect their wrist and they're doing like all their pole vaulting and stuff it's like a you put in like plastic um, plastic kind of these things like I don't know there's some plastic kind of pads behind your wrist and like it's, it keeps your wrist very rigid so that helped me a lot by allowing it to bend a small bit so I wore that a lot afterwards and that kind of saved my gave me more confidence to do stuff with my left hand yeah it almost sounds like what you're describing is when you go rollerblading when you're 8 years old and your mom gives you wrist yeah. pads to put on but the other way yeah. around protecting yeah. the actual yeah. flexion of the wrist yeah. uh, more yeah. than anything else so did you feel when you came back did you have the support of your coaches there or you know uh, was your coach Pat Lamb still at the time yeah Pat was Pat was there but he was kind of finishing up and to be honest my, my first game back was it wasn't a good one because it was the season after we won the Pro 14 and, and we played Scarters at the end of the following season um so this we played the Scarlets and the Scarlets went on to win that season, I think. So I was marking Johnny McNichol, which is at the time was like one of the best wingers in the league. So I had a decent oh, first game back. Loud. It was a tough way, one to, way too loud to come back to. We got we got fairly well beaten in the sports ground, um, but no, they, they didn't give me a lot of support. Everyone was obviously happy to see me back playing. They're sick of seeing me in the injury room, and their physios and the the injury kind of gym staff were happy to get me out of there. The day I finally got out of yes. the injury group, they. Got me a nice cake and flour, or cake and flowers and loads of little <laughs> gifts and stuff. So they're happy to see the back of me after about two years. I bet. So uh, besides besides your your brother Tig, you know who's been who's been your best coach? Would you say? Do you have a kind of a role model throughout yeah. that rugby playing career that you kind of really kind of pushed you, or maybe kind of made you kind of better than what you thought you could be? Yeah. Um, well, there's a guy called Nigel Carolyn. In Connacht, he's kind of head of the academy system and he coached the backs in Connacht, the backs for the senior team for a while and now he's over and or you think he might still be in Glasgow. So he was really good growing up. He kind of saw, even before I thought I was very good at rugby, he kind of, kind of could see that I had a lot of talent and I had a lot of like raw talent that, I, that could be, turn out to be something good. So he often like call me in and I have a very kind of generally kind of like an easygoing attitude about things. So I seem to, you know, before games, I never get too crazy. I'm always just kind of even keel. I'm just kind of like whatever about it. Um, I don't get like pumped up to simply get sick and stuff and changing them. I'd always be kind of just laughing and joking with the lads and approach a game real calmly and don't get too high or low about anything. But he was always like trying to focus me in and getting me more just to realize how good I can be. And Joe, you know, he always supported me in that as well. So he always like would be helping me do extra sessions and like don't help me review my games and help me become a better player. So he was definitely a, a big kind of driver, a good coach for me 
when I was young. And then when I was coming back from my injuries, Pat Lamb left that summer and we got in a coach, Kieran Keane, and he was, uh, he didn't last very long in Connacht, but for me, most lads weren't the biggest fans of him maybe, but I enjoyed, he was very kind of upfront and would tell you how it is to your face and wouldn't kind of soften the blow. If you're playing crap, he'd tell you you're playing crap. And if you're playing good, he'd tell you you're playing good. So for some reason, he took a big liking to me when he arrived in Connacht and he was kind of like, oh, here, I heard you used to be this great player, but I know you've just come back from this injury, but like, well, wow. just, yeah, just I heard, I heard he used to be a great player. <laughs> No, yeah, I just like at the time people were telling him I was out for a long time. I'd only played two or three games, and he's like, I, know, "I hear you could be like one of our better players if you just if you get back to where you were." So he's like, he gave me a lot of support then to kind of start me, and Joe, even for my kicking and stuff, he's a big fan of my boots, so he had me doing a lot of the exits over Jack and stuff. So he was uh, kind of pushed me on a lot as well. When I was kind of feeling like maybe being afraid to get injured again or to. So worried about myself, he kind of gave me the confidence again, just to be like, give it a go and give it your full effort again. And Joe, don't be afraid to get hurt. You're like, you won't. Yeah, everything seems to be all right. So you're going well. So just to back myself and so give him my all again. And I really enjoyed that kind of attitude from him as a coach, where you just kind of tell you things to your face as opposed to try and kind of soften blows. If you get me? I totally enjoy, get I enjoy you. ruthlessness in a way. Do you know what? You will find uh, loads of that once you get into the NFL. You will you will find none of it. I remember my um, my coach, uh, Coach Les Moss with the NAZ Wranglers. Uh, I'm now with Philadelphia, but last game of the season, conference final, I missed uh, I missed a drop kick, and he came oh, okay. over and he grabbed me by the pads on the field, and he said, "What the f- is going <laughs> on? What the f- yeah. is wrong with you? Get your shit together." And yeah. it was just, you know, but it, it, it might, I think it was something I kind of needed to hear at the time. I think it was something that was kind of like, now I was, I, I, I mean, I was aware of what I was doing and why I missed, you know, as you kind of analyze things sometimes yeah. afterwards and, and things like that. But I kind of like, there is no sugarcoating in American football at all. So having said that, yeah. having come across a coach like that might be a good time to talk briefly about your time in Clemson. Um, Cause I think that might've been maybe your first introduction to American yeah. football because you finished up kind of with rugby and then you moved in a, was it a coaching position you moved into in Clemson yeah. with rugby? And I was coaching, I got a full scholarship to coach the rugby team and do my mass, my MBA over there. So I was over there for two years and yeah, coaching the rugby team and just obviously being around Clemson, which is like, they'd just come off winning the national championship just when I got there. I got there in January, 2021. Um, so I just come off a winning season and yeah, just being around that school and how crazy the, they take the football there and like, I always say to people, my, one of my first weekends there, I went to the gym on a Saturday and it was only, it was only like an internal game, Orange v. White. And I went to the gym at nine o'clock on a Saturday and I get this phone call from one of the rugby lads being like, where the hell are you? And I'm like, what are you about? I'm in the gym. And they're like, you're two hours late. And I'm like, I'm two hours late to what? And then they're like, the tailgate started at seven. And I was like, what? And the game wasn't on until 7 p.m. or something like that. And so, yeah. And then I go down there at 10 of those thousands, tens of thousands of people tail gets set up about 12 hours before the game it's just crazy yeah and in American football for those that don't know maybe more of the GEA guys going there is a hell of a lot of parroting that goes on beforehand it's basically everyone in a parking lot outside the stadium yeah. music dancing beers some people bring their own barbecues it's usually grill off oh, the setups are crazy like some guy one of the guys on the rugby team, his parents had like this huge trailer would come in that had like a full kitchen setup, had two massive like 55 inch TVs connected <laughs> to it, had like just crazy amount of food. They could feed like 70 people at their tailgates. Like sometimes I'd go to the games and I'd leave at half time to stay at the tailgate. And it's it actually just better watching the game at the tailgate than being in the stadium. And it can be, they're, they're, they're very, very social. So you had a great time, you had a great time in Clemson. Yeah. Um, and then when was kind of your first time you watched the American football and maybe, like where did that nugget start at like hey I'm mean, actually like was it watching Tyke was it watching your brother because obviously he's at that same time 2021 2022 that's when I met up with him um, and as you so grace gracefully said at the beginning of the podcast you know how did I end up spending yeah. so much time with him and stay sane but <laughs> uh, he was going through that football journey too did that kind of inspire you or you were kind of thinking ah geez I could probably do this yeah. I'm, more, I'm more athletic than him yeah um, well to be honest throughout my rugby career I was always I used to like I loved just like working out and things like that so I used to always watch actually the NFL combine training videos so not so much the games but I'd watch people train and then the season Tim Tebow was finishing 
college going into the pros i was like i was like addicted to him at the time so i used to watch all his nfl games so i was on a big intro back then and then big I guy he's a big yeah, guy big dude people. yeah he's an he's an animal um so I, I watched a lot of it back then. And then, as I said, once or twice from my career, I did used to like think, here, the, all these guys do is kick and like they must know something we don't in terms of how to transfer it into rugby. So I did watch a couple of videos back then, but I, don't, I didn't take it overly serious. But I remember looking up a few spiral videos and like, oh, can I try it and try and do it in my rugby session on a Wednesday? Um, but yeah, then when I, I, I moved to the States on December 26, 2020, the day after Christmas, and then I, the first thing I did with Ty when I got over was, because it was COVID, they wouldn't let me in the house, but they'd let me see Ty out at the football pitch. Because um, I had to stay in like a, a separate house to them because they didn't want to get risk getting COVID off me. So we went kicking in Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, at the time, he was like taking kickoffs. And obviously, I never even trained it, but I was like smashing kick or hitting kickoffs further than he was and things like that. And like it hit a good, a decent enough field goal. So... I did kind of think maybe I'd, I'd give this a go. But then when I went to Clemson, I couldn't. I thought about trying to do a walk-on situation, but then mm-hmm. because... Big school, I, though. I, I big school. I don't know if you want to give people an idea of how big of a football school Clemson is. Just real quick. Oh, it's like... It's... And the head coach is paid $12 million a year to be the head coach. So that should tell you as much as you need to know about him. Um, Actually, that, that, that puts it exceptionally well. So yeah. now, now you're here... Now you've gone through, you're in the International Pathway Program with the NFL. Is it, is it kind of surreal? Like, because I'm, I'm looking at you, you look very composed, you look very calm. I feel like I'm Jack Carty, like, why are you so calm? And <laughs> you don't seem that nervous at all. But is, I mean, how, how are you feeling inside? Like, it, is it yeah. kind of a bit of a weird moment that you found yourself here at this point of your career after, you know, playing games with a bar through your wrist? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is a bit surreal. So um, I wasn't necessarily planning on doing it. I was just, obviously, Ty does lead a kick and I was helping him out a bit. And at first, I went to a few of the sessions to help out when I came over, came home during the summer and stuff. And the lads were doing kick and inspire and I kind of just watch. I'd wanted the ball back to them, but I wouldn't try and do the spirals around. It wasn't in my head to try it. And then Ty was like, oh, this thing, this opportunity has come up where they're going to try and find the best kickers outside of America to maybe go into this pathway program. But again, I was just kind of like, I just didn't pass any heat. He didn't say to me, he just kind of told me he's doing it, but didn't mention to me to try out for it. And then like a few months later, he's kind of like, he was like, the target market for him to find people is like, maybe guys finishing up their rugby career or playing ga that have a big boost, that have maybe time or are able to do this, willing to give up to do it. And then he's like, Another week later, went past. He's like, "Remy, one day, he's like, Dara, why the hell am I not asking you?" He's like, "You're the, literally the perfect person. You're finished playing rugby. You still work out all the time. You've a big boot." He's like, "You're my perfect target market." So he goes, go out to a field and try and hit a few kicks and draw a record and let me know what you can do. And then, so I basically is on. I think that was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. He goes, "If you can get me videos by Friday, so Thursday night in America, Friday morning, he'll go speak to." the NFL guys and show them the clips and he's like I can put you in front of them and see if they if they like what they see then they might be have a chance to be in it so I, I went out to this field and uh, I went to University of Western Missouri in Kansas and just videoed myself kicking kickoffs and field goals and punts and sent to the tie and then he was like they like what they saw so you're in if you want to be in and then even though still that's kind of a bit surreal to say <laughs> you're involved with the NFL but so it's the first few weeks it was kind of a bit surreal especially when I meet people in like work I was like the rugby, the funny Irish rugby guy or whatever. And then all of a sudden, I had to tell the owner of the company, I might have to do this stuff with the NFL. And he's just like, when I told him, he's like, what do you mean to do something with the NFL? And I was like, oh, I'm invited to the NFL combine. And he's like, like he's, he was actually in a meeting at the time. He's like spun around in his chair and was like, you're going to the NFL combine. He's like, you don't even play football. And I was like, yeah, I know, but I am. <laughs> and then it was just crazy and like, I found that even crazy to tell people. And even at the time, some people were like, oh, you don't sound like overly excited about it. But I was just like, it's all just kind of surreal to think that's what I'm kind of embarking on. That's what I'm doing now. Um, so let's, it, say, it, let's, say, let's say you go there in March, you perform brilliantly, you know, you put really, really well. Say Miami takes a chance on you. It's early August. You're in the Dolphin Stadium. Hmm. You're walking out for your first punt. Are you nervous then? Or are you still happy? Go lucky. Oh, you obviously get nervous. Even kicking in rugby, you'd always get, like sometimes it would cross my mind when I'm taking a conversion or 
like a penalty kick. It would sometimes be like up in my head. It's kind of funny that like every person, I just know every person in the stadium staring at me right now. And like that would kind of make you nervous, but also kind of makes you excited being like, this is kind of cool if I, if I nail this, then like everyone's going to be cheering for me. So, so is that yeah. the mindset that you use to kind of get over those kind of little demons that slip in or the little kind of negative thoughts, you know? Yeah. Um, you kind of just say, oh, but this would be great. Yeah, that's what I that's what I tend to try and do because I, I I always remember back that feeling after I scored that big winning kick. Like no one expected me to score it. It was sixty two meters out. None of the lads that ever really seen me kick that far. You know, I knew I kicked that far because I did it the day before in the captain's run. Um, so I was like, I knew I could reach. But even like at that time, I was kind of like, it's a long shot situation. So you just kind of just like, ah, oh, go for it. Like give it just give it your best shot and go for it. So I feel like. The same thing will apply. I'm kind of just like, just whatever happens, happens. I know I've done the prep recently. I've put in a lot of hours. Joe, I've practiced everything to my best of my ability. And if you've done all that and prepared well and your training's going well, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do your job on the day. So I feel like if I have all that preparation behind me and Tyg put and pressure me all the time to do well. So if I can deal with him shouting crap at me in the middle of training, I'm sure when it comes to Miami Dolphins, the nice sunny weather, the sun in the sky and sun cream all over me, I'll be able to hit a nice hit a nice tight spar at a five second hang time and fifty something odd yards is the plan. Perfect. I think that would be a great start. Well, look, Dara, I feel very confident for you. Um kinda ooze confidence and composure and I think that's gonna be great. For a punter, it's going to be great uh, for the combine. I wish you the absolute best of luck. Thank you so much for coming on into the arena. Uh, really appreciate it. If you have liked this podcast, please uh, subscribe, give it a rating, give it a review, give it a share. Um, we have loads of guests lined up. We're joined again today by Dara Leader. Dara is going to compete uh, through the NFL IPP program uh, in March in Indianapolis with uh, other Irish guys, Rory Begg and Mark Jackson, and Charlie Smith. Dara, we wish you the absolute best of luck. We're super confident you're going to make it and can't wait to see you on the other side, hopefully not the tailgate side, but actually in (laughs) the arena. On the field. Yeah, thank you very much for having me and best luck to yourself as well with your new new kicking gig too. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the arena. We'll talk to you next episode drops next Thursday.